Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's webcast, Heat Pipes, High K Plates, and Vapor Chambers, Selection and Modeling. Sponsored by Advanced Cooling Technologies and Tech Briefs Media Group. I'm Billy Hurley, Associate Editor with Tech Briefs Media Group, and I'll be your moderator today. Our webcast will last approximately 30 minutes, and there will be a question and answer period at the end of the presentation. If you have a question, you may submit it at any time during the presentation by entering it in the box at the bottom of your screen. Our presenters will answer as many questions as possible at the conclusion of the presentation. Those questions not addressed during the live event will be answered after the webcast. Also, twice during the presentation today, we will present you with a poll question, which we invite you to answer at the appropriate time. In order to view the presentation properly, please disable any pop-up blockers you may have on your browser. At this time, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Pete Ritt is Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Advanced Cooling Technologies. Mr. Ritt joined ACT in 2010 to head ACT's technical services business. During this time, the group has successfully provided thermal consulting, design, and prototyping solutions to commercial customers in the lighting, renewable energy, industrial equipment, and medical industries. Also on the line for our live Q&A today is Devin Pellicone, Lead Engineer of Special Products at Advanced Cooling Technologies. Devin has over seven years of experience developing advanced thermal solutions for a wide range of aerospace, military, and commercial applications. He has successfully demonstrated prototype thermal management systems for directed energy weapons, power flow controllers, laser diodes, and a variety of high heat flux electronic technologies. So now I'd like to hand the webcast over to our first speaker, Pete Ritt. Pete. Thank you, Billy. I'm Pete Ritt, and along with Devin Pellicone, we are delighted to be with you today. For today's webinar, we will be talking about some very effective thermal passive management solutions heat pipes, high K or high thermal conductivity K plates, and vapor chambers. All of these solutions have been around for a while and continue to provide superior solutions for electronic cooling as well as other applications. For each of these solutions, we will discuss the fundamental operating principles, offer some insight as to the selection criteria of how they should be used, and then provide some straightforward but effective modeling methods to allow the design engineer to predict what thermal performance benefits can be achieved. We'll then conclude with a wrap-up and take some questions. A trend we see across all industries, military, medical, lighting, etc., is that devices are becoming smaller and more powerful. As such, thermal management for these devices is becoming both more important and more difficult. The solutions that we discuss today, heat pipes, high cake plates, and vapor chambers, deliver excellent thermal management, but in different ways and for different applications. We'll explore all of that, but one thing these thermal solutions have in common is that they offer the added benefits of requiring no power to operate, make no noise, and have demonstrated decades of reliable performance. Let's now learn a little bit about them. We'll start with heat pipes. In the schematic below is a heat pipe. Heat pipes are sealed vacuum devices. They are housed in a metal tube. Inside the tube is a wick structure and a small amount of a working fluid, which will transfer phases from liquid to vapor and from vapor to liquid. Most applications are copper tube, copper mesh, and water, but there are several other envelope materials, wick structures, and working fluid combinations. To work, a heat pipe must be in contact with a hot evaporator where the heat goes in and a cold condenser where the heat goes out, as can be seen in the schematic. The hot and cold temperature difference, or delta T, is the driving force for the heat transfer. The heat from the evaporator causes the working fluid to vaporize. The vapor then flows to the cooler end where it condenses to a liquid. The condensed liquid then returns to the evaporator by capillary force of the wick structure. In this way, there is constant two-phase heat transfer, which produces a very small temperature differential within the heat pipe, typically 2 to 5 degrees C. Let's now have a demonstration of a heat pipe. The metal tube sticking out of the center of the enclosure with the ACT logo on it is a standard copper rod. To the right of the rod is a copper water heat pipe. 
Both are painted with a temperature sensitive paint that is green when cold and yellow when warm. Both are connected to a cold thermoelectric below. In the video, the first step will be to move the copper rod from the cold thermoelectric to the warm one. You will slowly begin to see the copper rod change color from green to yellow as it begins to heat up. We'll then move the heat pipe in the same way. As you see, the heat pipe heats up and changes color very fast. When the heat pipe is returned to the cold thermoelectric, it also returns to the green color. The copper rod does as well, but not nearly as fast as the heat pipe. Please go ahead and start the video. Quite a difference between the two. Of course, there are performance limitations for any device, and that certainly includes heat pipes, high K plates, and vapor chambers. Key factors that must be considered when implementing these devices is temperature, as this will determine the appropriate working fluid, height against gravity of the evaporator versus the condenser, as this will be important for wick material and design. Water is the best and most commonly used working fluid for both heat pipes and vapor chambers, so we'll take a little time to explore that. First of all, water can be used as a working fluid from approximately 25 degrees C to almost 250 degrees C, well beyond its nominal boiling point. However, at lower temperatures, water becomes more viscous and less effective as a heat transport mechanism. Fortunately, for most electronic cooling applications, these lower temperatures do not require much thermal management. The heat pipe performance curves plotted on the, on the right are from ACT's online calculator, where transport power is plotted as a function of vapor temperature. You can see from these curves that copper water heat pipes can transfer significant power above 25 degrees C. Water heat pipes freeze below zero degrees C, so any heat transfer will be through conduction. Properly manufactured heat pipes can operate over many freeze-thaw cycles, where the heat pipes are subject to very low temperatures, usually minus 40 degrees, followed by temperatures, say, 150 degrees, then back to the lower temperatures and up again. Finally, one of the questions that is often asked is how far can a heat pipe operate against gravity, where the evaporator is higher than the condenser and heat must be moved downward. Heat pipes can operate with the evaporator roughly 9 to 10 inches above the condenser. Heat pipes are used for spot cooling, moving heat from point A to point B. Spot cooling refers to cooling discrete components, such as moving heat off the chip to a remote sink. In the top right picture, a heat pipe is used to move heat away from the case containing an electrical device to a cold rail at the top. In the lower picture, heat pipes are used to move heat away from a mounting plate for a heat source up top to a base condenser plate below. A major benefit of heat pipes is the ability to remove heat which enables devices to run at higher power without concerns of overtemping. Heat pipes have significantly higher thermal conductivity than metal conductors, having thermal conductivity ranging from 10,000 to 100,000 watts per meter K versus 400 watts meter K for copper, for example. Heat pipes require no pumps or compressors and are the lowest cost option beside pure conduction. Further, heat pipes can be bent and shaped to meet countless geometries without affecting its thermal performance. Finally, heat pipes are also rugged, shock and vibration tolerant with decades of good performance in real life environments. Some important criteria when considering using heat pipes for spot cooling are, heat pipes are not structural load-bearing components. Heat transfer occurs in one dimension, from discrete spot to discrete spot.
for copper water systems, the operating range is from approximately 25 to 125 degrees C, although the range can go higher with water as the working fluid, but using other envelope materials. And of course, at freezing, the only heat transfer is through conduction. Copper water heat pipes can typically survive from minus 55 to 200 degrees C and typically have a heat flux of approximately 50 watts per centimeter squared, although with custom wicks can go higher than that. And as we have mentioned, heat pipes can survive thousands of freeze-thaw cycles. Before we move on to high K plates, we'll turn it back to Billy for a polling question. Thanks, Pete. Now it's time for our first poll question today. It will appear on your screen now. And the question is, does your company currently utilize or is your company considering using heat pipes, high K plates, or vapor chambers in your products? And your choices are A, yes, we use them now. B, uh, we're considering using them in the next zero to six months. C, we're considering using them in the next six to 12 months. Or D, we have no current plans to use them. So you can make your choice by selecting the appropriate button on your screen. Again, does your company currently utilize or are you considering using heat pipes, high K plates, or vapor chambers in your products? So as you make your selection, I will hand the presentation back over to Pete Ritt. Pete? Thanks, Billy. High K plates, high K for high thermal conductivity K, are embedded heat pipe plates. They take the isothermal properties of heat pipes and embed them into a standard aluminum plate with epoxy or solder to increase the overall conductivity. The heat pipes are strategically placed to get good thermal results while not affecting current geometry or mounting features. Embedding heat pipes into these aluminum plates can increase the effective thermal conductivity from 200 watt per meter K up to 500 to 1200 watts per meter K, depending on the number and location of heat pipes. Properly placed heat pipes within the high K plate can reduce hotspot locations. High K solutions are compatible with both liquid and air-cooled chassis and can increase fin efficiency and lower fin weight. The heat pipes plus solder are similar in weight to aluminum, which makes the overall plate weight similar with or without embedded heat pipes. But the high K version has a conductivity nearly three to five times greater than bare aluminum. These plates can also be used as structural components within systems. Shown here is a thermal analysis of an aluminum plate containing many high-powered electrical components with and without embedded heat pipes. Pictured on the far left are model results of a solid aluminum plate without any heat pipes. You can clearly see the three hotspots, two at the top and one at the bottom. Pictured in the middle is that same aluminum plate, but now with heat pipes embedded in them. You can now see that the max temperature has dropped about 20 degrees C and the temperature uniformity has improved greatly. Pictured on the right is the actual plate with the heat pipes embedded in it. The heat pipes can be seen as silver lines. Because high K plates use heat pipes as the heat transfer agent, many of the same selection criteria we define for spot cooling with heat pipes also applies here. The main high-K specific parameter is plate thickness. The high-K plate thickness needs to be able to fully contain a heat pipe that has sufficient diameter so that there is adequate vapor space to move heat. Nominally, this is a 3 millimeter diameter heat pipe, which would require a 1.83 millimeter thick aluminum plate. And while aluminum is the most common high-K plate material, magnesium can be used to increase thermal conductivity almost up to the same level achieved with aluminum, but with reduced plate weight. ALSIC can be used to directly attach devices onto the plate without a thermal interface material. The pictures on the right show some examples of conduction cooled cards. In both cases, heat pipes, which would be placed in the groove seen in the picture, will move heat from the center to the cold rail. Now we'll move to vapor chambers. Like conventional cylindrical heat pipes, vapor chambers transport heat from a heat source to a heat sink with a very small temperature gradient. However, vapor chambers have a different form factor and as can be seen in the diagram, enable concentrated heat inputs as seen at the bottom of the schematic to be spread in two directions. 
This provides for excellent heat spreading across the heat output surface at the top of the diagram. Typical vapor chambers are two to three times more dense than a high K plate and cannot be used as a structural element, but provide a 10 to 100 times improvement in thermal conductivity versus a high K plate. Vapor chambers are best suited for applications where there is a concentrated heat flux, as in many laser applications. The vapor chamber can transform the heat flux from the heat input source to a very uniform temperature gradient across the heat output, offering the potential for smaller lightweight fins. Vapor chambers do have some size restriction. The minimum thickness is nominally 3 millimeters to ensure there is adequate vapor space. The maximum footprint is approximately 25 to 50 centimeters, as larger areas may not provide the same excellent thermal uniformity. Maximum heat flux for most st standard copper water vapor chambers is 60 to 70 watts per centimeter squared, although 500 watts per centimeter squared heat flux has been demonstrated on a high performance vapor chamber seen on the lower right. Another important point is the maximum temperature that current copper water vapor chambers can operate at is 105 degrees C. At the higher temperatures, the vapor chamber can pillow, causing deformation of the structure and non-uniformities in performance. There is new IP developed here at ACT that resolves this problem and will soon be commercially available. The most common vapor chamber envelope material is copper but aluminum nitride with direct bond copper is also available for high performance applications like the one pictured in the lower right. Here is a table that summarizes each technology discussed today, evaluating density, spreading, thermal conductivity, max heat flux, minimum thickness, maximum height, and relative cost versus aluminum. Progression from top to bottom shows increases in both cost and performance. This table may assist the design engineer when conducting thermal trade studies for their applications. The spreading column refers to the dimensions that heat can be spread. Heat pipes, as we discussed, spread heat in a single dimension, while both aluminum and vapor chambers spread in two dimensions. High K plates are a hybrid between the two, with the heat pipe component in 1D and the aluminum plate in 2D. Depends on geometry means not a heat flux limit, but a limit on chip temperature. Two-phase heat transfer devices weigh more compared to aluminum for a given thickness, but have significantly higher thermal conductivity, which easily justifies the increased cost. Here is a summary of the selection criteria across each of these technologies. Aluminum plates have a thermal conductivity of 200 watt per meter K, moves heat in two dimensions, and is usually the cheapest solution. It should be used whenever possible. Heat pipes have a thermal conductivity range of 10,000 to 100,000 watts per meter K and are used for discrete point cooling. High K plates have a thermal conductivity range of 500 to 1,200 watts per meter K and is used for selected and strategic heat spreading. Vapor chambers have a thermal conductivity range of 5,000 to 100,000 watts per meter K and are higher cost and performance devices compared to high K plate. The condenser surface of the vapor chamber is isothermal with only one to two degree temperature differential across the whole surface. Now we'll turn it back to Billy for a final polling question. All right, thanks Pete. It's time for our second and final poll question. It will appear on your screen now question is, when looking for thermal management solutions, what is the single most important criteria for your company? And your choices are A, cost, B, performance, and C, reliability. So you can make your choice by selecting the appropriate button on your screen now. Again, when looking for thermal management solutions, what is the single most important criteria your company uses to make decisions? Cost, performance, or reliability? So as you make your selection, I will hand the presentation back over to Pete Ritt. Pete? Thanks, Billy. Now we'll move into examining some modeling techniques for heat pipes and high K plates. 
The key input for designing a heat pipe solution is to know approximately how much power a heat pipe needs to transfer and what is the maximum ambient temperature range that the heat pipe will be operating in. In addition, it is necessary to know the orientation of the evaporator with respect to the condenser. Is it higher, lower, or variable? Do we need to move heat with or against gravity? The least favorable orientation is usually the design target. Once determined, there are four main heat pipe performance limits that must be addressed, capillary, entrainment, sonic, and viscous. The capillary limit, which is usually the most critical, is the point that the wick structure can no longer carry the working fluid back to the evaporator. It is affected by wick structure, working fluid properties, acceleration environment, and orientation with respect to gravity. The entrainment limit is when the velocity of the vapor flowing back to the condenser is such that it is shearing the liquid off the wick structure and preventing it from reaching the evaporator. The sonic limit is when the acceleration environment that the heat pipe is in is so rapid that the vapor flow becomes choked and unable to reach the condenser. And the viscous limit, which like the sonic limit is principally an issue only at cold startup, is when the vapor pressure differential is so low that the viscous forces become dominant. Of course, heat pipe designers are very familiar with these limits and can calculate them very quickly for all applications. As we just described, heat pipe performance is governed by several well-defined limits. For terrestrial applications, the first limit reached in most cases is the capillary limit, which is the ability of the wick structure to overcome the various internal pressure drops created in the heat pipe. The figure shown here is a plot for all limits, capillary, entrainment, sonic, and viscous. As you can see, capillary limit, the red line, ultimately determines the capacity in this case. Of course, there are several heat pipe design considerations that affect these limits and must be accounted for as well. Key features include heat pipe diameter, length, orientation with respect to gravity, working fluid, and wick structure. It is, of course, important when designing with heat pipes to be confident that the heat pipe or multiple heat pipes can move the total required power. ACT offers a free calculator on our website that can be used as a first approximation of the heat carrying capability for copper water heat pipes. This calculator makes assumptions on the wick structure, but is a good initial tool to predict specifically the capillary limit and more generally heat transfer capacity. Here's an example of using the heat pipe calculator. Required inputs are seen at the top in red. In this case, an 8-inch long heat pipe that has a 2-inch evaporator and a 2-inch condenser in a horizontal orientation needs to move 50 watts of heat over a temperature range between 60 to 80 degrees C. What diameter heat pipe is required to do this? As you can see, only the 6 millimeter and quarter inch diameter heat pipes are capable of moving this much heat over this temperature range. As we mentioned, this is a good approximation tool, but even if you are not getting the results you're looking for, please don't take this as a final word. Contact an experienced heat pipe designer for more accurate results. Now that we have an understanding of heat pipe performance capabilities, let's look at how it can be put to use to model a potential solution. The first step in almost all thermal management solution modeling efforts is to develop the thermal resistance network to determine what the heat pipe requirements are needed to deliver the necessary heat transfer. This is an example for a typical electronics cooling application. The thermal resistance always start with the heat generating component, the case temperature in this case, and ends with the heat being dissipated, the air temperature here. Each interface has a thermal resistance that must be accounted for and must be within the allotted thermal budget. In these networks, heat pipes will generally produce only a 2 to 5 degrees C temperature rise across the vapor space inside the heat pipe. Once it has been confirmed that the overall thermal budget can accommodate the maximum heat loading of the device and that the heat pipe is the right solution for this application, we can move on to the specifics of the thermal management solution. To accurately calculate rise through a heat pipe embedded system using hand calculations is very difficult. 
finite element analysis software is often used to get more accuracy. This first method uses basic conduction to simulate heat pipe performance. After using the design guidelines to confirm the necessary heat pipe design and performance, place the heat pipes into the model. Assume that the heat pipe is a solid component. From here, there are three easy steps. First, start with a bulk conductivity of the heat pipe. We suggest starting at 10,000 watts per meter K. Next, run the models and check the temperatures extremes on the heat pipe. Then, confirm using the heat pipe calculator mentioned earlier that the selected heat pipe design can move the desired power in the application environment. If it does not, use the calculator to modify the heat pipe parameters accordingly and repeat the three-step process. A similar approach can be used for high K plates. As we discussed earlier, tested results show 500 to 1200 watts per meter K, depending on geometry and heat sink conditions. To quickly model high K plates, replace the aluminum or base material conductivity with 600 watts per meter K and model it as a solid plate. If you get favorable results, that usually means a good high K plate design is achievable. Today, we explored heat pipes, high K plates, and vapor chambers, which are providing superior thermal management solutions for a variety of electronics and other applications. We discussed how each of these solutions serves a different application, be it spot cooling, conduction guard cooling, or high intensity laser cooling. We also reviewed the selection criteria for each and included a summary table of the key properties. And finally, we provided some straightforward heat pipe and high K modeling principles that can be applied easily for these thermal solutions. We thank you for your time, and we'll throw it back to Billy for some questions. Thanks, Pete. At this time, we'd like to begin our Q&A. I'd like to welcome Devin Pellicone to the line. Devin is the lead engineer of special products at Advanced Cooling Technologies. If you have a question, you may submit it by entering it in the box at the bottom of your screen. Then we have some questions here. We'll try to get to as many as we can before 2.30. Do you use thermal grease at the heat pipe sink interface? And also, what is the best way to attach a heat pipe to the sink? There's three basic ways that we would attach a heat pipe to the heat sink. We have used thermal paste. Um, that's one common method. If you need to remove your heat sink, that's a good way to have a temporary attachment to your heat pipe. But you can also epoxy the heat pipe to the heat sink using a thermal epoxy, or you can solder it directly in place. Soldering an epoxy or permanent solutions, thermal grease would be a, a temporary solution. Devin, this next question refers to a figure, the 50 watts per centimeter squared. Is that the cross-sectional area of the pipe? It's not. The heat flux limit on the pipe is dependent on the surface area of the heat going into the heat pipe, so that would be the perimeter of the heat pipe times the length of your evaporator section. What is the difference between flat, the flat heat pipe and the vapor chamber? Is there a different modeling approach uh, to be adapted for both? There is. Uh, a flat heat pipe is simply taking a heat pipe and flattening it down, so it's still a 1D um, conduction type approach. Uh, a vapor chamber is a 2D conduction approach, so a, a vapor chamber will spread heat in two directions, so there's a different modeling approach to make sure you take advantage of that spreading conductivity. Devin, this will be our last question today. How do you determine how many heat pipes uh, a given system needs? There's two basic principles for that. The first one is dependent on what your heat load is. So if heat went over how much heat capacity a heat pipe can handle based on your capillary limit and viscous limit curves. So you first need to make sure that you have um, enough heat pipes that can handle your heat load. And then the second criteria would be to make sure that you cover your cooling surface properly so that you can maintain an even temperature across the entire surface that may need more than one heat pipe for large heat input surfaces. Um, even if one heat pipe could serve your, your heat load needs, you may need multiple just to make sure you get even cooling across your surface. All right, we'll end it there. That concludes today's webcast. Again, if we did not get a chance to answer your question today, our sponsors will do their best to address those questions after today's presentation. So our thanks to Pete Ritt, 
Devin Pellicone, and everyone out there for joining us. And just a reminder, this webcast will be available on demand at www.techbriefs.com for the next 12 months. Have a great